Good morning, good evening, or good afternoon, depending on where and when you're watching this broadcast. I'm Thomas Fusser, my friends, and this is Disclosure Tonight. Happy freaking Thursday, everybody. Thursday, March 28th, 2024. As we continue in our drought of disclosure news, we've got an interesting guest coming with us tonight, Dr. Keith Taylor, to talk about the state of disclosure, where we're at, where we have, got, where we're going to, as well as a whole bunch of great updates coming to us from our uh, one of the people we support out there, Matt Lazlo at Ask a Poll. He's got some interesting comments coming from yes, Senator Gillibrand. The comment was so good, it's on our headline. Plus, we also have a, another exclusive interview coming with Senator Annapolina Luna. On that note, let's go ahead and welcome in our audience and see who the heck we have out there. All right, let me go ahead and, uh-oh, I, Fred, you didn't start up the sound effects machine. Okay, Fred. No, Barney, I mean. <laughs> no, here we go. On that note, let's go ahead and welcome in our audience and see who the heck we have out there. We have April Aller Coleman. Welcome, April. Brendan England. Charles Kerr. The Charles Kerr is here. Good to see you, Charles. Defense of Truth. Dr. Tim Taylor. All the way from the great country of Taiwan. Great to see you back here again, Tim. It's been a while. Hopefully all is serving you as best as best can be. That's usually what I say when people ask how I'm doing. EBEA just popped in along with Eli McGinnis. Firefly is here along with Glow Watcher. Jan is at it again. J-Cat's here along with Jeremy Eaton. Kathy is out there along with Kelly Broat. And those piercing blue eyes. I'm looking at you, Kelly, looking at me, looking back at you. Thank you for coming out, my dear lady. King Bull is here. Melissa Hogan, Metal Gaming. Mike Disclosure is in the chat as well. Uh, Neil Carr, uh, Niles Guy, Peggy with Crockett and Tubbs, all the way from the great state of Florida, along with Steve. Great to see you four. Uh, Resonates here along with Rough Ready. Sunsaver from NHH made it in. Thor Panku, all the way from Canada. Uh, TK is around along with YOY. Oh, cool. YOY Fools. Good to see you, my friend. And also coming to us from the United Kingdom, our dear friend, Yo, Tommy Tanker, also known as Andy. How about that? Got their audience pretty quick, which means, my friends, it's that time of the night to go ahead and welcome in our panel. God, oh, Jesus Christ, that was so loud. Sorry, panel. <laughs> Sorry, everyone in the back. Let's go ahead and welcome in our people. Let's see who the heck we have in the back on the list. First on the list, we have our dear friend. He was in the chat. Now he's in the back. Let's welcome in the old timey tanker, also known as Andy. How's it going, Andy? Yeah, hi, Thomas. Yeah, I got a night off work tonight, so I'm actually able to enjoy the show. Oh, for so Good Friday. Good yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And it's really great to have Dr. Taylor in again. It's going to be a really good show. I have, I feel it. Feel it in me waters. Yeah, hey, I hear you. I hear you. Great to hear that you've got that day off as well. As I try to get all my sound effect board up here and quiet this down a little bit. I've got tomorrow off too, so I don't have to go to bed so early tonight. But how about that? Thank you for coming in, my dear friend. Also in the back, we've got our very own Ms. Cussout. How's it going, Ms. Cussout? You going to let it rip today? <laughs> no, I'll try to control myself. Um, thanks for, for having me. I'm looking forward to the show. Thank you very much, my dear lady. Also in the back, a man coming to us from the great state of Oregon. I mean, Oregon. I used to call it Oregon, but it's not anymore because we know Neil Carr is there. Welcome, Neil. Hey, Thomas. Uh, hey, Keith. Good to see you. Uh, Andy, hey, everybody. Everybody in the chat. Hey. Welcome, my friend. Like in the hat. Like in the hat. Uh, Top of the morning Brock. to you, sir. <laughs> also in the back, coming to us from the... From on the other side of the globe, let's welcome in a man where it's way too early in the morning in the country of Sweden, Mr. Ali Alvian. Welcome, Ali. How you doing? I'm doing fine, uh, Thomas. And and uh, I think you, you look um, fresh and um, on your toes today. No pains? Yeah, I think so. Did you no, say I you're think... wearing no pants? Pain, 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 headache no like. <laughs> Uh, and I just want to congratulate you and Mike. Uh, you know, the, the way that you uh, present uh, the shows here, it's always interesting. And uh, just elated with the Bob, uh, uh, the technician here. 
yeah. fantastic. It blew, blew my mind. We yeah. are serious yeah. about not being serious unless we're dealing with trolls. And trust me, we've got the wrenches to deal with the trolls. So come on, bring it on. <laughs> yeah, go after them. Pick them. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you got to be serious about not being serious. But thank you very much, Ollie. Also in the back, we've got our very own Rachel Smith. How's it going, Rachel? Hi, Thomas and Chad. Looking forward to a great show. Oh, so am I. We also have from the East Coast, from the state of New York, our Tia Loreno Abraham. Tia, how you doing, my dear? Hey, lady? Thomas. How you doing, man? Pretty good. You ready to kick some ass in the chat tonight? I absolutely am. I'm ready for it. There you go. Thank you for coming in, my dear lady. It's always a pleasure always having a pleasure. you here. And that takes us up to our very own Officer Stadenko. I mean, Mike Disclosure. How's it going, Mike? Oh, it's going well. And um, this is going to be a great show with uh, our good friend Keith, who's joining us tonight. It's going to be a lot to talk about. And um, I think the uh, the audience will enjoy it. Looking forward to it, Thomas. Oh, I'm looking forward to it. Looking forward to it as well. You know, um, yeah, we'll bring Keith out with that. Keith Taylor, how the heck are you, my friend? Welcome to the show. I'm doing great and so happy to be here tonight with everyone else. Looking forward to uh, spending this time uh, sharing information and learning and uh, giving each other some hope for the future. Well, we could use some hope. Not necessarily some, yeah, and some change for that matter. <laughs> it was a great slogan. We could use it again for UFOs these days, I tell you. But as we were talking before the show, it's been like six months of good drought. We're almost at the end of April, which means we've had a third, the fourth quarter, uh, the last three months of 2023, the first three months of 2024. And disclosure, as far as moving forward, as far as things kind of going on, it's been fallen off a cliff to a degree it's gotten quiet there's been a lot of pushback coming from the dod from sean kirkpatrick did you even see that sean kirkpatrick is going to be on an interview with good old stephen greenstreet from the new york post <laughs> it is it's it's happening so there's things happening on the other side of the world to go ahead and say no ufos don't exist but as you know Luel zondo has said in the past mike uh if humanity knew, could see all the UFOs that are around them every day, all day long, right, my friend? Oh, yes. We were just talking about this uh, privately before the show. Yeah. Yeah, everyone would be dramatically surprised by uh, the activity going on around them. Yeah. It would be interesting. Um, yeah, and as far as Stephen Greenstreet, and Sean Kirkpatrick, it's no surprise there. That's like the odd couple. Are they getting married? <laughs> good question. Yeah, you never know. Almost as good as uh, Matt Ford bringing out the Mil Mitch McConnell dildo. <laughs> yeah, oh, God. I sent yeah, you a link on that one. He did. <laughs> yeah, no, I saw it. Let, let, let's, we have a trying to keep I know, I know. But getting right into something a little bit more serious here. Uh, at least I'm not the only one who is having fun about things. One of the things we're talking about with um, uh, Dr. Keith before he came out, before we started today's show was I've got the cutest little video, folks. And I just want to bring it out because it kind of gets to that point of what does the non-human intelligence really have in store for us? And uh, everyone says, oh, no, they're good. They're beneficial. They're benevolent. They're not here to hurt us. They're not malevolent at all to a degree. But this brings up a really good, really cute video I saw the other day. And uh, let me go ahead and bring this one up here. And it's it's in Japan from on Twitter from a place called The Real Untold Study. And you can see we got a bunch of little guinea pigs. Now, the key word here is guinea pigs. Because we've always talked about the non-human intelligence kind of screwing around with us. Potentially, we're the guinea pigs in the farm, in the zoo. But look how cute they are. Just kind of running around and they take and they put out this bridge. And all the guinea pigs are all so happy to run up the little bridge and to go home for the end of the day and go home from work and just rush back to their place. And, you know, I looked at that and it's like, how cute, how nice. I sent it to a couple friends. But then it was kind of like, wait a minute. 
what do they you see all these farms videos out there of people who have guinea pigs going out there and the whole bit and what is the real reason to have guinea pigs on farms it's not to raise them as pets or companions the real reason that there's they do that with guinea pigs it's for fried guinea pig they're on the menu could we be on the menu you never know. You know, we were, we were talking about this one earlier, Keith, and I know this is kind of a grim way to look at it, but there's, you know, uh, a lot of unknowns out there, and there's a lot of things going around around us in the skies that are either moving too fast, meaning they're moving, you know, 15, 13, 15 20, 50,000 miles per hour, and we just can't see them, or they're out there in another light light spectrum, right? Indeed. I, I think uh, one of the things we have to come to the realization is that our technology needs to catch up to what's actually happening out there. Uh, so as we, as more people have access to, you know, the, the various IR and other uh, capabilities, as it's being used more often around the world, they are catching a lot more information. It kind of reminds me of when uh, in 2004 uh, they changed out the uh, radar systems, the FLIR systems, I believe, yeah. for the for the uh, jets, and then you start having these things being detected by those new systems. The old systems simply couldn't see them, but they were probably still there. And so now we have the ability to detect them with our technology. That means all of a sudden they started to pop up. I don't think so. And it's certainly if we just look at the many, many thousands of accounts of individuals seeing things that they couldn't explain, um, <clears throat> our, our technology is just coming to the part, point where it can, uh, uh, our non-classified technology is coming to the point where we can start uh, identifying them. Our classified technology, the sky's the limit so to speak. Yeah. Who that knows? Is Who knows true. what they have? That is true, absolutely. And talking about technology, about the things being in the sky that we can see, there's recently been a sighting that happened in New York of uh, what it looks like a, oh God, a traditional cylinder kind of object that was caught over one of your bridges, wasn't it? Verrazano Bridge, yeah. It's a very uh, non prosaic sort of shape doesn't look like a bird uh, of any that I've seen. Um, and could it be some man-made object? Who knows? But uh, th that's certainly an interesting thing to see right in the city of New York. Yeah. And, and the interesting thing about it is the image itself, as it goes across the screen, we're not seeing a smooth movement of the object meaning this thing is moving so fast, it's jumping from place to place to place, that that's the best the camera can do to pick it up. And as it can see it, there's actually four frames of the object going across here. Let me bring it across a little bit. Come on, you, let me get into this. You can see it going from the very left side of the screen, going across, going across again, and then poof, it's gone. But they did a great job of stabilizing, and I think I may have a tweet here, if I can go ahead and take a look and find it, that actually shows the object, and it, it's pretty clear, and it's interesting to see that, you know, we're actually getting some imagery of UFOs that actually aligns to the movement patterns that align with the technology that, that they have not aligning with the camera technology of when people are capturing it. Meaning you'll see a UFO come down, moving slowly, do something, and it moves off to the screen fast, but it's a smooth movement. And any of the videos, including some of the ones I've been pointing out to by Lou in the past, uh, especially one down in uh, South America at an, at an air show, uh, this is the exact kind of movement that you're looking for. Absolutely. Uh, what... All of this continually shows is we don't know as much as we think we do. Not everything that we see and capture with our little cameras and video cameras can be explained prosaically. 
If you want to argue about percentages, that's fine. But what you cannot argue about is that it's been happening for decades. And uh, from the point of sightings to the point of physical contact, there have been things happening that Americans deserve an answer to. They, we need our government to fess up and explain in very simple terms what we're dealing with, what we have been dealing with, and most importantly, what the government has done in order to keep this from us. Yeah. Because that, I think, is going to really be the one of the most difficult things to accept. Because it's on it, it's obvious they haven't been truthful about what's been going on for over seventy-seven years. They've been doing everything they possibly can to cover up the truth to keep us at bay. And uh, here's you know we were kind of talking about this earlier, but I know where I'm coming from. Do you think? The people of America, more so the people of the world, are ready for some truth? Because they've been given nothing but a bunch of lies and cover-up for a long period of time. I, I think they are ready, some, some more than others. I think that uh, we're going to, uh, as we see more uh, information um, made public, you'll see more acceptance of it. There will probably be some, we've heard ontological shock a lot. Absolutely, there are going to be folks that are going to be challenged by information that is beyond what they have accepted as a worldview for their lifetime. But that does not change reality. We need to know what, is, what our reality is, not what we've been allowed to believe. Yeah, I, I, I hear you, my friend. I, Go ahead. I was, I was going to say, I was at the uh, disclosure rally in front of uh, Senator Schumer's yeah. um, uh, office on the 21st. And I, I wanted to uh, thank a gentleman, Osvaldo Franco, who's with the Disclosure Revolution. It's the first yeah, time he'll I actually be on our show tomorrow night. That's great. Uh, he, he deserves all the, the, uh, the credit for putting in the hard work to arranging that to, uh, to, to occur and probably under short notice. And even though the numbers were not what we would have liked, perhaps, the, the folks that were there were uh, folks that were heartfelt about making sure that Schumer understands that there is uh, there is a lot of support. And I think that a lot of individuals are having a wait and see, uh, you know, sort of uh, they're just waiting to see what else develops before they're going to be willing to show their support or whatever else they feel. Looking at the Schumer legislation, one of the most important parts of it, at least that I saw, is we got beyond talking and focusing just on the craft. We, and, and for me, personally, that's the PSYOP that our government's doing. Focus on the craft. Focus on the capabilities of the craft, how the craft looks, how the craft moves, what the craft can do, et cetera, et cetera. Not talking about what is the craft doing here when it's here not just necessarily over our military bases but over our civilian population it's not just here on over our country it's around the world but more importantly it's also over and beneath our large bodies of water whether that's like the great lakes or our major rivers or even our oceans and seas so it's about talking about okay so they're under the seas what are they doing down there are they living down there do they have a base down there what are they doing up between us and the moon how are they getting here all those kind of things more importantly what are they doing here and daryl brings up in the chat he says over our cows and that's something else we we're talking about earlier today is yeah why are cows well the answer for me is simple you want to change the population Change your food supply. Put stuff into the food supply. Let it go downstream automatically, and poof, you'll get the changes that you want to see. You remember the accounts? There are many accounts of angel hair material being yeah. associated with UAP. Uh, you, this angel hair would 
you'd see it in the atmosphere yeah. and then it would disappear. It's like a, a, almost like a spider web. It was like yes. a light stringy white kind of stuff that they saw falling from some of the UFOs. And the interesting Correct. thing about it was after it was exposed to the air for a period of time, this stuff would dissolve. Right. Now, if you were going to try to change some sort of biological entities, that would be one way to do it. There are lots of ways to change, uh, you know, environments. And, and that's something that unfortunately yeah. hasn't gotten much uh, scientific interest. Yeah. Uh, and because we don't really know what it is. We don't know how to measure it. We don't know what effects it's having on humans, if any. Yeah. Now, Resonate says in the chat, they are concerned about what we are doing. Well, that's true. They've been very concerned about our nuclear weapons. Now, the real thing is, are they concerned about our nuclear weapons because potentially what we could do to the biosphere? Or are they afraid about our advancements of the technology that could potentially get to a point that could be used against the non-human intelligence. So there's two different sides of this coin we can look at it. Are they looking at it for the betterment of humanity, or are they looking at it for more of maintaining their long-term plans? Yeah, I, I would uh, venture to say uh, we are not in a position, uh, at least uh, I, I don't, I'm not aware, where we can understand UAP NHI intentions, just as we don't understand if it's a singular or multiple, I tend to think it would be multiple entities from different places, from different, uh, you know, everything from interdimensional to extraterrestrial. It could be all of the above or none of the above. So intentions would fall in that same category of unknown unknowns. Uh, yeah. So what we do know is that they have been appearing they have they, they are somehow attracted to uh certain materials nuclear materials and uh and, and that that much uh again if more information is revealed the more knowledge we'll have as to the extent to which it's occurring now, now if, you we, if you remember there were sightings going on in denmark uh, back in the 1500s in Denmark and Germany and another a country in the area where there were a num over like two or three years, there were these major battles that were being observed in the sky that were recorded on wood planks and everything put down in posterity for it. But it's not like they just suddenly arrived here with the advent of a nuclear weapon of our nuclear weapons and our nuclear devices. They've been around for a long period of time, and even well before the stuff that went on in Europe, if you look back at the Mahabharata in India, they've been here for 5,000 years, 10,000 years plus. So it's not like it's an all of a sudden kind of a thing. There's clear evidence that's out there that they've been, st they've been poking their fingers in us for a while. And, and I think what's most exciting is that uh, where the detention has finally gotten around to looking at USOs. Now, years ago, there's a classic book, Invisible Resonance, that really looks at this issue of underwater uh, inhabitants that are intelligent and perhaps have technology that's a lot better than ours. Uh, Richard Dolan's going to come out with his uh, his next uh, book dealing with, I think he said, 600 incidents of USOs, which should certainly help us uh, get a better idea of how much humans have seen it. But humans don't see a lot. So there could be lots of activity in sparsely populated areas that we just are not, not going to have a lot of visual sightings of. So we don't know what we don't know. And 71% of the Earth's uh, uh, top cover is, is ocean. Yeah. So there's just, uh, I, I think of this as sort of an age of discovery where we're just coming to terms with how much we don't know about the world around us and the universe around us. Yeah. 
Very true, very true. we got a couple people with their hands up in the back. I kind of know where Nick's going maybe on this one, talking about abductions. But, Nick, go ahead. Uh, yes, I like uh, oh, Nick, you're breaking up there today, buddy. Oh, like, can you hear me now? Is yeah, we it, got it better? you. Uh, like, like, do you believe the, uh, like, religious folks will have a, a like, harder time like Keith, uh, like, with this subject? Well, uh, will religious folks have, I, well, religion deals with faith, and that's a relationship that an individual has with, the, you know, a higher being. This is not, we're not talking about faith. We're talking about uh, other realms of reality, other non-human intelligence. We don't have to have beliefs in whether they exist or whether they don't. It's just a matter of understanding what their role is on this planet with us. So you can still have your belief system, uh, your relationship with a higher power, but NHI and UAP are just like us. They're just another aspect of reality that we have to deal with. Now, I am talking nuts and bolts. Obviously, there's more to this than nuts and bolts, especially when it gets to consciousness. And I'm a lay person when it comes to this issue. I'm not a scientist and I'm not, you know, a religious uh, expert. But anyone who has a critical mind has to look at this and understand that there is some relationship with consciousness and there's some relationship with spirituality. and these things are tied together. So we're gonna find out together as humanity, as more gets revealed to us one way or the other, clearly government and those inside government that wanna maintain secrecy are gonna do everything they can to stop the best efforts of those who are whistleblowers and other uh, stakeholders that want the truth to come out. Yeah. Because clearly the government's been lying for the longest time. But the problem is, Keith, we're stuck with the liars actually telling the truth, which is going to be the hardest thing to get the answers out of them. And when they do give it, is it really going to be the truth or is it just going to be more lies on top of existing lies like we're getting now? Well, if it's more lies, then it will be uh, the same stuff that we're used to. We're used to getting yeah. lied to. We're also used to people revealing things, leaks coming out. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, up until a few years ago, there was no real process that whistleblowers from the classified realm could take. There's no pathway for them to, in order to safely yeah. and legally reveal wrongdoing in the classified world to uh, the general public and, and uh, I'm guessing the Congress. But one of the biggest problems we have with whistleblowers is it's verbal testimony. There's no evidence being put forward to the American people. So even though we can have someone as credible as David Grush coming out there telling what he's seen, what he knows, the proof is in the pudding, the proof is in the evidence, the proof is in the information, the the details that are presented to the American people. We don't have pictures. We don't have videos. We don't have anything. We have some good testimony that's there. But for majority of the people out there, it's not enough. We don't have the appropriate security clearances, and we don't have the need to know. So for oh, everyone who says, classified I want everything proof. about this to a point to where we can never see the actual factual so, information. So, so we have to temper this idea that nothing exists and I need proof I with know. the reality that unless you have a need to know and have security clearances, you are not allowed to know what David Grush knows. And he's not allowed to tell you what he knows. However, he's allowed to tell certain members of Congress if they have the appropriate security clearances and need to know. So what a conundrum we're in that the folks who are supposed to have oversight over the programs are not allowed to know about them. I think that's the frustration you've seen in Congress with the briefings they've had with 
representatives from the IC and DOD. Who but if you ask had, me, that sounds like that's going over the Constitution, meaning the people who are supposed to have oversight don't have the clearance necessary to have the oversight. In other words, the government can be doing whatever the heck they want, and they, they're not going to have any oversight, and they can get away with it. And the two things we can blame for this, one is the National Security Act in 1947, came after Roswell, gee, I wonder why. But then we have the Atomic Energy Act of 1954, a classifying everything and anything that has any kind of nuclear decay and shutting it down. No one can and, uh, see anything. Nobody can know anything. It's not foyable. We can't get the information out. Any questions asked are not going to be answered because it's up the utmost level of national security, which... Well, well certainly, uh, Grush alluded to what you're talking about. And I wanted to also mention... Uh, I don't think he was even allowed to talk about Roswell, which should be something that should raise eyebrows. Why wouldn't he be able to talk about Roswell if it's, you know, Air Force already put out reports that it's case closed? I have that report in my library. Now, so Lou Elizondo he... also is not allowed to comment on Roswell, but when he was here on Disclosure tonight about a year and a half ago, that was one of the questions I asked him. I said, what is your personal opinion did Roswell, as we understand it, happen? And he said, yes, absolutely. And that is the only time Lou has ever commented on Roswell. For, but and, for the most part, it's and, off the agenda for anyone to talk about. And you see that he had to be careful with ha what he said. He didn't say NHI, UAP, or that. He said, yes, Roswell happened. Yeah. So you're, you have to sort of uh, just... Uh, Read between the lines and understand who you're hearing this from. Someone in a position to know and also in a position to go to jail if he really, you know, releases information he shouldn't and probably highly monitored yeah. by IC. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Why do you think he lives in, the, in, the, in, the, in a valley out in Wyoming where he can see everything for miles around his house because he wants to be able to see what's coming. So what is uh, frustrating, I think, most in this period where you see really active efforts from folks who are uh, actively employed by the IC or DOD community, as well as folks who are outside of that realm, what is most frustrating is that you have this uh, debunking going on. And I think if anybody in your audience really wants to get a, a very good take on how uh, disinformation efforts are done, look look at the Quirk Zone on YouTube. Jim Quirk has a, a wonderful analysis of how disinformation works. You don't even have to discuss the why, just understand how it works. Now, me, if I'm looking at the Department of Defense having handpicked reporters from certain media companies give information to be coordinated to show up in newspapers all over the country or world stating that there's nothing to be found according to the Arrow Report regarding UAP. There's nothing here. Move along. So we're going to have a press, in other words we're going to have a press briefing. We're going to select the specific individuals who are going to be there. More importantly, you can't come with cameras. You can't come with videos, cameras. You can't come with any kind of recording devices. You can take notes and that's it. And you can't ask any questions that would challenge the official narrative. Uh, this is like 1952, you know, Robertson panel stuff. Yep. It's uh, clearly an attempt to shape a narrative that will keep the general public from generating any interest in whatever information, however mind-blowing it is, that is uh, revealed or shared by people like whistleblowers. Now, if you look at other efforts, uh, not through the whistleblowing process that David Grush has gone through, 
look at the recent article by Matt Ford and Chris Sharp, and I think it's Josh Broswell, about the CIA Crash Recovery Recovery Program. Uh, the Office of and Global Access, OGA. Office of and, Global Access. And interesting thing about it, after that story came out, the CIA was actually working with Google to remove all the links out of their search system to make sure people couldn't find it. Yeah. Uh, well, that's what I would expect. If it's a classified program of such a sensitive nature that it goes beyond our nuclear secrets, then yeah, I would expect them to disappear any any references to it. Uh, but that shows you that individuals who are familiar with or have worked in these programs are concerned, they're upset, and they see that the efforts to hide information about UAP, classified programs, especially recovery programs, uh, that it's alive and well. And our efforts, meaning those in the general public who have an interest in this and are trying to get UAP disclosure, their advocates, our, our efforts are so important, especially when we understand who we're up against. And it can just be a, an official disinformation campaign, or it could be other entities out there that are trying to influence how people think. A perfect example is Wikipedia. Rob Heatherly has done incredible work. Uh, the biggest uh, thing comes uh, out of it, I understand where Rob's coming from on this. We've known Wikipedia is bad information for the longest period of time. It's not just about UFOs. It's on a lot of things. So sure. while we can try and get Wikipedia to clean up their act, the reality of it is it's, a, it's an information source that nobody in their right mind should be going to. Then why is YouTube using it to provide context whenever a show talks about abductions? Why is it being considered the same as say Encyclopedia Britannica? When well, it's we, providing we, that would be a that would be a good question history. for Google. And it it is, but while we are questioning it, it is actively being portrayed as a yeah. honest broker, where clearly organizations that uh, want to it was the guerrilla skeptics they want to influence the general public by attacking any topics controlling any pages on Wikipedia dealing with UAP. And that's not just uh, entities, it's also individuals, yeah. as we well know. But it extends so, well beyond UAP, unfortunately. It's just, it's a crooked news source. And unfortunately, that YouTube and others are still trying to rely on it, even though the, the proof in the pudding is we shouldn't be relying on that as any kind of a news source. Or perhaps just provide a warning next yeah. to any oh well this is providing context yeah. but it, it tends to be manipulated by yeah. uh you know parties who want to right. influence what you think now all the people who do report who do all the moderation on wikipedia they do it all for free they all donate their time uh, to it now if you ever go to wikipedia and you go there and they say we need money please help us raise money it's not for hosting fees it's not for technical infrastructure. It's to pay the board members of Wikipedia who oversee it and to pay their executive role salaries for dealing with this. So it's a real interesting, it's a, it's a catch-22. They present it as one way, but then on the other side, oh, that's what you guys really need the money for. So you really don't need my money. It's just for the people who are sitting back in the office not doing any of the work. So uh, to that point, uh, I, I don't say I would say that maybe some people do get money for, you know, the amount of time that they spend eight to 10 hours a day editing pages. And maybe they are provided this money by organizations like CSI that uh, that are trying to uh, influence, have influence campaigns through this subtle kind of uh, efforts to discredit legitimate persons and efforts 
towards UAP disclosure, but you're absolutely right. This is nothing new. There have been lots of examples where companies have paid to have uh, information placed or removed from Wikipedia. Uh, this uh, different aspects of uh, of uh, non-traditional, say, alternative medicine, other areas have also gone through this issue with uh, Wikipedia. But if it is as uh, unreliable and so easy for manipulation, then it should be treated as such. There should be some sort of warning, or maybe Congress should get involved. Maybe it should be treated like a publisher instead of like an internet uh, entity. Yeah. And like you're and, saying and about then, people getting paid from alternative sources, what is the old saying? Grease the wheels? Grease the wheels and, you know, money well spent if you are trying to promote some sort of campaign to change people's hearts and minds. Yeah. So. Great way so to put that, it, Keith. That, Absolutely. Yeah, no, it, it works. Yeah, it does. Neil, you've had your hand up for a bit before we get on to our next piece talking about Gillibrand. Yeah, uh, just a couple of comments. Um, the um, the thing with the nuclear weapons, um, I think they, I really think that they share our space. That they're, they're like, if they're interdimensional, they're right here with us. And like a nuclear blast can very well rip through multiple dimensions. Um, I think that's uh, probably a reality that they've already had to face uh, during World War II um and testing even who knows um and then my other comment was i was listening to jack sarfati last night in x um he was on a uh he was speaking in a room and uh, he had some really really interesting things to say regarding time travel and that you know there's an idea that maybe what we're seeing some of it is uh possibly uh, us from the future trying to learn from us in the past uh, what they need to know to I mean, it's kind of convoluted but uh, but um, he had uh, he had brought up the thing again about the, these craft actually being uh, a form of artificial intelligence and that you you had to be on good terms with the craft or and it, it would actually then teach you how to fly it and stuff. Uh, and I just gotta wonder sometimes um, where he where he gets his information. It's really uh, he he's either smoked a lot of uh, interesting stuff, or uh, you know he's 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 hung out with the right the right kind of minds uh, over the years. There's you know? a lot of speculation out in that area, Neil, and it's just hard to say where Jack is getting from his information. He's more theoretical than actual on that respect. So he thinks big picture. And there's been a lot of conversations about what the stuff that uh, the stuff that uh, Jack is saying. He's more more than anything just parroting the conversation of what's been going around the circles for a long period of time. But thank you for that insight, my friend. Good, good point. Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. In terms of pilots, I think of Grant Cameron's book about, I think they're called Sky Pilots, where he has uh, compiled a collection of uh, inf interviews, I think, or information about people who claim to have actually piloted uh, non-human craft. Uh, but this is, this, is, this is the thing. Let's say someone comes up with an expl explanation about NHI or UAP or craft that sounds plausible. That may be plausible for that one specific type of craft. That's certainly not going to, there's going to be a lot of diversity, just like there's a diversity of life on this earth. Uh, every kind of thing from the smallest, you know, bacteria to yeah. the largest uh, masses of uh, things that, like whales that are in the ocean. How about like fungus? Because yes. some of the some yeah. of the largest, uh, if you want to call it, uh, creatures we have on this planet are both plants. Uh, the birch trees, I think it was a birch tree. There, there's these not the birch tree. It's one of these trees that has this huge organism. It's all the same actual tree, and it stretches for miles. And also we have underground fungi networks, which are the same way. So we're clearly not the big, you know, mammals for that matter. We're big, but there's things on this planet that outnumber us 10, 1,000 to 1. So, so as we go, as we discover, as we go further down to the depths of the ocean, life exists. It, it exists near volcanic 
uh, structures that exist on the lower lowest depths of the ocean, life that we cannot have perhaps anticipated. And what if life also exists in the upper atmosphere? There's some sort of life form that's adapted, been able to find a way to exist there. Life can exist pretty much in almost every uh, environment that, that we're aware of, and perhaps some that we're not aware of. So uh, the, if there's life, then the, the capacity for intelligent life to exist all, is also there. Yeah. So great points, my friend, great points. Now, jumping across one of the main stories we want to go ahead and talk about today is that uh, in an interview, we're going to have a little short little minute clip coming up from uh, Matt Laszlo talking with uh, Kirsten Gillibrand uh, just uh, several days ago. Uh, Gillibrand is saying the U.S. quote, lacks the ability to detect these craft around U.S. bases and nuclear sites. Where well, I'm just scratching my head. You're getting saying, huh? Boy, do they have her in hook, line, and sinker. She's taking whatever information she's getting out of R or wherever, and she's just running with it and believes to it like it's, yes, Aspen, thank you, Pando. Uh, like it's the truth. And let me go ahead and just play this clip here, and we can reflect on it. Uh, here we go. Let me play this one. I think it should come across for everyone to hear. Fingers crossed. Here we go. Let me ask you, did you see that? Jordan, she has this half letter last name, warning about her on UAPs, kind of. Can you hear that, Keith? Who's alerting? It's really, really quiet. I'm sorry, Matt Laszlo. It's has, okay. He's got <laughs> Let's just play it and we'll get through it. I don't remember what it said. Yeah. I imagine I saw it. But I think they're most worried about the safety for pilots and yeah. domain awareness around bases and around nuclear sites. Um, it's essential that we have full domain awareness yeah. in our most specialized, most top secret locations. Yeah. We don't want spying by adversaries. And so we ha hadn't developed the technology or the ability to um, detect all these items and and there's been a couple of drone attacks that are yeah. concerning so oh interesting attacks what attacks or surveillance well, it's not the right word so it's not, really I know it's really yeah. it's, so dro you're right drone attack isn't the right word but drone incursions incursions that are disturbing and need to be known and um, seen and be able to be taken down. Yeah. So we so we had that we had some we had some hearings on it already. Yeah. Sorry. Interesting. Appreciate it. Sorry. Here's the thing. Gillibrand is saying we don't have this technology to see these things. Which goes mm -hmm. across all conventional wisdom because we know uh, for many years, ever since we had the Aegis system put on line back with the uh, uh, USS Nimitz uh, back in the day. And we have other systems that the United States uh, has the ability to see anything and everything from sea level out to beyond the moon, the size of a grapefruit or larger. And I believe it was also David Grush who it also has said that we can even see the craft when they're cloaked. So... I think Gillibrand is talking about the incursions that happened over some of the Air Force bases recently that they had brought out saying that it was out there. They couldn't do anything about it. It was going on for hours. And people are asking, why aren't we doing this? And she's saying, we don't have the stuff to detect it when clearly we have the technology, but we've got someone in Congress who just takes the word and the the information coming out of the DOD like it's coming out of the book of the Bible, and she's going along with a hook, line, and sinker and just parroting the dialogue that they've been saying. And to that reason, that's one of the reasons why I lost faith in Gillibrand a year, a year and a half ago at least, and a lot of people saying, oh, no, no, give her time, she's okay. But she hasn't come out of that state yet. Your thoughts on that? Uh, she... It seems to be acknowledging that there is a problem and that they do exist. She calls them drones. What drones means to the general public, meaning a man-made, unmanned device, may have a different explanation for the military or how they understand drone. Drone may include 
you know, UAP. Uh, because when I hear drone, I think of a drone like in the conventional sense. That may not be the same that their drone in the, for the military may be a, uh, uh, just a, a placeholder for something more unusual like UAP. We don't know. And uh, the, the, the point about not having the technology, uh, she, she it, it would be good to understand if, if that could be more nuanced in terms of her response. But is some of this being detected? Uh, it is obviously being detected somehow. They're seeing it visually. Some of it may be on radar. Some of it may have stealth capabilities or low versibility that we're not able to yet address. But some of it we probably do. Certainly it sounds like it based on the whistleblower in a position to know who has had the, uh, he was allowed to mention that to the general public. You mean David Grush so, for that matter when now just to be clear so everyone re remembers David Grush actually worked for was the, uh, the NGO National Geospatial Intelligence Agency where he was actually taking the information the images of UAP that were being seen by satellites and presenting them to the executive branch. Yeah and and, and the John Gray I believe he's, his uh, pseudonym was the, the fellow who was also working with Grush in that environment, who also yeah. said, yes, Grush is saying what is happening. And also yeah. Colonel Nell. Carl Nell is another individual who is yeah. very familiar with that environment and is uh, there's no daylight between him and Grush in terms yeah. of accounting for it. So th th there may be uh, national security reasons why she cannot be as open in her responses as we would like maybe uh, then she should take the point of saying i'm sorry i can't comment on that versus coming up with the things that she's been saying because it's almost like she's doing more damage by what she's been saying keeping her mouth shut versus actually just saying i can't comment on that uh well if you're like me then you are listening to every word that individuals in a position of authority say, especially Congress people, senators, oh, yeah. and you are reading into it any sort of, uh, you know, hope that they are in a position to reveal something to us that they know about this issue. So yes, it, it probably would have been better if she'd simply said, I can't comment on it, perhaps, or maybe what she was saying was, you know, factually correct, but, not the full picture right it's hard to tell um I, I would not necessarily take a position that she's against disclosure uh based solely on the comments that she makes i would I be wouldn't. more interested in, in what she's doing and what they are doing and so let's see what happens with this effort to uh revive uapda the Shimmer Rounds uh, Amendment. And which, which she has not made one comment on at all. As long as she votes for it. Yeah. That's enough comment for me. Yeah. There you go. Now, uh, before we get to our next piece talking, uh, we got a clip here of Anna Pina, Polina Luna getting interviewed. Uh, I, we, we showed that one video clip earlier of that craft that was flying over a bridge in New York. What I do have is I have a higher resolution, let me, oh, uh, desk chat, no, oh, not that one, hold on, document, here we go. I do have a higher resolution image that was cleaned up uh, using AI to, if you want to call it, clarify the image. That's kind of what was potentially seen flying, in, flying over New York at breakneck speed. Wow. Well, you know what, that, that can be added to the collection of many thousands of images that we have uh, showing something not prosaic that is uh, in our in our airspace or in yeah. our oceans. It's uh, some just another addition to what people have been documenting for years and years and years. So Absolutely, it's that in combination with uh, you know the the Project Blue books and the uh, 
the Condon reports and perhaps the Arrow report, you know, Queen, a dusted off version of the Condon report, but the Robertson panel, we should have an understanding as a society that there have been at least elements within government that have worked very hard to keep this UAP issue from becoming uh, an interest in general society. And in, in fact, have worked hard to make sure that people get ridiculed, stigmatized as a result of bringing it up. And, and it's not me just saying that from my opinion, just look at the opening statements of uh, the congressman for the congressional hearings last July. Yeah, uh, he said that we we. I'm sorry, the the not not uh, the July uh, conference, but the initial uh, co uh, congressional hearing where you had the two representatives from the DOD speak. The, the 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 main point that he made was that they had to get rid of the stigma. People are not going to report it. Pilots are not going to report it, no matter how dangerous it is. Commercial pilots, military pilots. Because they don't want to lose their jobs. Yeah. Uh, we're in a we're in a position that our own efforts to suppress an information are dangerous to people that we care about that are that are driving these planes in the uh, in the air. Yeah, and while I, flying them. And I would have to say that uh, Kirkpatrick has done a great great job of reinforcing the stigma versus actually trying to break it down. So uh, it, it's a constant battle of going forward, backward a little bit, and hopefully as time moves on, we'll get there. Uh, Ali, you have your hand up, my friend, before we jump on to this next uh, uh, piece from uh, Ask a Poll on Annapolina Luna. Yeah, I, I, I have two points here. Uh, the first um, about Gila Brown, I think it could be even worse uh, because we know that it was uh, secret meetings with whistleblowers within the Senate years before uh, the setup of Arrow. And uh, my hypothesis here is that uh, behind the scenes, the, the UAP question, question was growing. And to, to, to meet that, Dilly um, Brown set up this Arrow um, organization just to to um, uh, to get the control of the situation so no one else would take any other me measure uh, start another kind of uh, agency uh, so it may be started uh, much earlier and it's more planned that we think and she's part of the cover-up my second point is looking in Wikipedia and reading the article about David Rush. And most of us know the background and the, the competence of David Rush. And when you read the, the article in Wikipedia, it's laughable. And it's also a very uh, good um, uh, was a evidence of how far from reality they are uh, reporting and describing uh, every uh, political controversial question in, in Wikipedia. Wikipedia has become totally useless when it comes to controversial yeah. uh, political or topics. I'd uh, say pull the funding, just, let it fail, let it go away. <laughs> well, well, yeah. You know, I, I would love to think, think that, you know, uh, misinformation or disinformation about someone like David Crush, well, no harm, no foul. You know, it doesn't really make a difference. However, it does. Whistleblowers are particularly vulnerable uh, because the, the, the organizations that they are whistleblowing against may retaliate in illegal as well as legal ways. He talked about administrative terrorism, but what about the, um, what do they call it? Wet works, where individuals end up not surviving. Yeah. Uh, that that a natural life anyway uh, the harassment that can occur where your homes are invaded or you're getting threatening phone calls or maybe other family members there there are there are uh, consequences for that misinformation or disinformation being put out there 
uh, because one of the things I think people don't realize is the extent to which uh, people like David Grush and the other whistleblowers have risked their, not just careers, but life and limb to talk about something that uh, has profound uh, ability to change the world that we live in today that that is the significance of the information that they have. And there's just obviously a strong effort to keep them from talking. Hopefully they, what, what they're hoping to do, I guess, is scare them from yes. participation. How, how many people were supposed to be at the July 26 hearing? Six? How many showed up? Three? Because yeah. the other three were- Threatened? Basically, threatened. so uh, if you're threatened away from testifying to Congress, that's that's a, that's a lot of threat. Uh, yeah, and, uh, and that's yep. So uh, you don't you don't have to you don't have to believe in conspiracies, but certainly you can look at what is happening, and yes. if you have any kind of. Uh, interests or critical analysis you can understand there's there's a problem here yeah and and we've got whistleblowers that are willing to talk about it we should not be uh making fun of them or dismissing them or trying to tear away at their credibility we should be protecting them yeah and, and you need a spe special agency to take care of them to protect them legally and also there has to be uh, charges brought against uh, the bureaucrats who who um, uh, harass them or take their uh, security or the pensions or their uh, or suspend them. There has to be uh, accountability for those who make those decisions. Absolutely. If there's not accountability for rogue government entities, then what does that say for our democracy? And as far as the Constitution because I know we mentioned it earlier, uh, this is a part of that allegation that these entities and individuals were violating the Constitution. And I know people like uh, Danny Sheehan have been working on getting uh, in individuals together to examine, perhaps challenge this, uh, this issue. But um, isn't Danny yeah. Sheehan and the Romero Institute going and trying to go ahead and start getting people to be sperm and egg donors to try and get those to offer those up to the non-human intelligence so they'll stop abducting us but it seems like a lot of that abductions stopped in the early 70s when we legalized abortion well i i i imagine that he uh you know speaks off the cuff about issues just like everybody else does uh but in terms of this issue of challenging the unconstitutional actions of rogue elements within government, I would take that quite seriously. Yeah. Just look at his track record. Yeah, that was something that Danny talked about on the show here about a year and a half ago, maybe a little bit longer, maybe almost two years ago, when he was on a UFO roundtable I had with him, with uh, Lou Elizondo, Sean Cahill, and Danny Sheehan, and in that broadcast we had, Danny laid out his full plan to take on the constitutionality of the National Security Act that was put in place back in 1947 because it changed, fundamentally changed the power structure and the oversight of our government to a place where we're no longer really the United States of America, as I put it, we're now the National Security State of America. Uh, I would um, n I would not recommend sharing your plans publicly about whatever effort you're going to take because the adversary will listen quite closely. Oh, he uh, laid out, I, I, as far as I understood, he laid out the entire plan on that show. People were surprised. Well, well uh, maybe he has other things planned as well. I, I don't know, but I do know... Uh, that uh, I remember Lou Elizondo having a recent message on X about 
things will be revealed at a time and place of his choosing. And that is, uh, that is, I think, perhaps the best way to go when you're dealing with such an intelligent adversary that's really, really good yeah. at, uh, at, at dis and misinfo. Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, next time we play poker, I want to play against you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, I, and I don't well, gamble. Did I I'm just joking you, here, my did friend. Did I ever yeah. tell you I was an undercover in narcotics for a few years? No, you didn't. Yeah. You're a regular yeah. officer, Stadenko. Yeah, some of the narcotics got you. No. <laughs> I was telling my uh, students, uh, I was teaching a class tonight, uh, my uh, name. Uh, it was uh, John Carlos, and I had my fake ID was not like the fake ID that college students get. It was actually government issued. So my license and social security number and other things were in that assumed name. So, and that's just sort of local street level narcotics enforcement. I can't imagine what intelligence community uh, enforcement actions would look like. Oh, yeah. It's got to be fun stuff, I tell you. All right. Let me go ahead and get to this. Uh, the title on this one is, is UAP in, are UAP investigations heating up? Quote from Luna, we have a lot of information going to our offices. On that note, let me go ahead and bring up the picture on this one, desktop document. All right, here we go. Again, this is coming to us from our friend Matt Lazlo at askapole.com. We're a regular supporter of, of Askapole. And if you want to hear up to the date, uh, uh, up to the minutes of information coming from reports out of D.C., Ask a Poll is a great place to go. More importantly, it's a great place to go ahead and support because Matt now has himself and three uh, now paid interns to help him get this stuff, the information together faster and out. So let me go ahead and bring this up here and play this clip. Here we go. Do you have any prompt on the motion to vacate? I haven't seen it being introduced yet. Oh, yeah. What do you... Did you see that Joint Chiefs of Staff? memo on UAPs? I have not yet. What do you, I mean, it's interesting that it goes to that level. I mean, um, I, I've told you guys, I think that there is absolutely, without a doubt, something there, and I think the level of pushback that we get is pretty obvious, and yeah. so I look forward to being able to hopefully get something seriously considered for the next Congress in regards to an actual committee, because I think it should be investigated, yeah. and you guys can see there's a ton of bipartisan support, yeah. but, you know, I'm at the point where I've also to, you know, we have a lot of information coming to our offices, so being able to sift through what's uh -huh. accurate, what's disinformation, I think that that's incredibly important, so we're making sure that we're not putting out wrong information or false information to discredit the movement. How would you describe the relationship between the Pentagon and the contracting industry? Yeah. Are they, like, have we seen the wedding like Eisenhower foreshadowed? I think, I think it's very evident that there's not enough oversight and that we have to make sure that we're, you know, staying cognizant. Yeah. Sorry, I'm uh, making sure yeah. that we're being weird. Yeah, Deja, what kind of last question? <laughs> yeah. Are you worried? Cause it, could it be that the SAPs that Russ brought up are hidden in the contract? Well, and that's exactly why we need more oversight. Sorry. Bond on right now! There we go. Because you guys don't feel like you have it. Yeah, well, they're be, they, you guys know that they've denied us access. Yeah. So, I mean, we again need more people involved, but you know, there's a, t a ton going up, on, up here, so we have to just make sure that we stay focused on it and that we continue our support for it. Have you ever talked to Rubio about it? I have, not been able, I have not been able to talk to anyone in the Senate. I think I've told you guys that, but we've not really been able to Have you requested make it? Um, we've reached out to see what we can find from different yeah. staffers and whatnot, but yeah, we'd be happy to sit down and have a meeting with all of them. As so. always, I'll be watching. Have a good recess, ma'am. There you go. Interesting, uh, interesting uh, piece. Your thoughts, Keith? I think the most important thing I heard from that conversation was they denied us access. Yeah. Congress. Uh, and, I mean, there's certainly a background behind that. Like I said at the beginning, you need security clearances and need to know. And so members of Congress, without those two things, are trying to get more information. And they are actively doing it. And that's a really refreshing thing. An important thing to see them do because they're fighting for the rest of us. Uh, 
and they're fighting the good fight and we need to support them any way that we can. And But we did hear the one thing coming out of her, which has been a regular piece we've heard from many people in the House of Representatives, is they can't get to talk with any senators regarding this topic. They're shut down. They're not given access. They're denied it, which, huh? Yeah, that that's uh, clear, clearly that's uh, current real-time uh, challenges that are being addressed. Uh, and, and, and I think also this idea of having the select committee is maybe tied into that as well. Uh, it's hard to tell from the outside looking in, especially when uh, the folks that are involved are limited in terms of what they are able or willing to discuss. Yeah. Because when you discuss it publicly, for our benefit, because we want to know we're acquiring minds, you may also be defeating your efforts. Yeah. Because by making it public, I mean. So yeah, absolutely. Hopefully the audio was a little bit louder. I found the volume. I was able to crank it up for you in the back so you could hear it a little bit louder. Uh, Brian Pemble, who's uh, one of our uh, viewers who calls in the back, who has a lot of interest and a lot of uh, insight on the political scene. Brian, your hands up. Yeah, Dr. Taylor, great to have you back again. Um, it's always a pleasure. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to let everybody know that, that they are trying to oust Speaker Mike Johnson. Um, so we may have, in addition to this two-week Easter recess here, um, so there's going to be nothing going on in the government in these next two weeks, we may see uh, Speaker Johnson get ousted, which will throw the house in the turmoil, in which nothing happens. Um, um, so I, I would encourage everybody if, 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 if any of your uh, Senator house members are coming back home to try to sneak questions in and push them on this, if you can, um, but, but hopefully, well, you know, I'm not sure where Mike Johnson stands. I think everybody does not know where he stands and, and, uh, hopefully, and I'm just trying to be optimistic here that the UAP caucus and all them can push Johnson to get that select committee that Dr. Taylor's talking about with uh, the, uh, the uh, subpoena power. That's, that's a major game changer if they can do that. Yeah, and, and think, about, uh, think about what he's up against. Uh, moneyed uh, source resources that are supporting members of Congress in influential positions that are dead set against efforts to uncover this information. And a select committee may be the best way to do it. And that might be the thing that they try best to uh, not happen, just like the UAPDA. That when that was uh, disassembled, I think you could say the jig was up. You, you could say you don't know or there's nothing there but when you if you disrupt active efforts to uncover it then you're you're basically playing your hand so uh the select committee would be another vehicle with which to get this information and eventually get it out to the public and for the folks that are dead set against it they're going to work very hard to control anybody who can make it happen and and if I may just real quick add on to that, um, I totally agree. If if a select committee is formed, in my opinion too, that also forces the Schumer Rounds Amendment to be brought back up as a clean bill. The House usually forces the Senate to act. Uh, the, you know, uh, the Senate historically has always been slow acting. So in my opinion, it's incumbent upon the House to force the Senate to act because I would love to see that come up as a clean bill. So I guess we'll see. Um, but but I, I completely agree with what you're saying. Yeah, and and uh, Brian, you were right. Uh, so contacting our Congress people, I know there are wonderful websites. Uh, Nick Gold has a website, and and, and Lester Nare, UAP Caucus, and De uh, I think it's Declassify UAP. But there are lots of ways in which you can uh, contact your Congress people and let them know that uh, you're interested in this, you're concerned about it, and you you want uh, justice to be done, frankly, because yeah. this is an issue not just about satisfying your curiosity, but about uh, providing justice to the American public. 
Absolutely, absolutely. Neil, you have your hand up, my friend. Yeah, thank you. And that was a great point. And um and when uh when our elected officials um run into the Weebins and the Wilbies, uh we've been here before and we'll be here after, uh you what is what is their best argument to to their denial uh like and and what 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 are we seeing here like really um well, why is it so dangerous for these contractors or the government for that matter just to just to just even acknowledge like you know we found some stuff uh we're not going to show you but we have it and we're working on it like what do you think well, I think we're on the outside looking in and we can all speculate together. Uh, but mm -hmm. we have to rely on the words uh, of, and the, rather the claims of the whistleblowers, the allegations, the testimony, the sworn testimony of whistleblowers like David Crush. He's the only one that has been made public, as far as I know, regarding these classified programs. But we have to rely on them to tell us what actually exists. And so far, they've told committees in Congress and Senate their concerns. And those could, their concerns should be our concerns. And, and not just a select group of folks who are interested in it in the UFO community, but anybody who is concerned about democracy and uh, upholding the Constitution in this country. And for that matter, humanity deserves better. Yeah, definitely. Glenn, hopefully your audio is good. We'll find out in a hey, second. Hey, is that all right, Thomas? Yeah, you're good. Wow. Yeah, hey, great to be back. Good to see you. Welcome good to, to see New Brian. Zealand, my good friend. To... Thank you, mate. Good to be back. I haven't, I've always uh, watched your programs from behind the scenes. But um, anyway, uh, just a question for Dr. Taylor. Um, uh, basically, um, I was under the impression that it, Ben Rich said it would take a, you know, an act of God to get these things out of these private companies. Um, basically, when they get the the um, recovery materials, it becomes their property. Is that correct? Uh, I I am not certain that that is true. I, I honestly don't know. Uh, but I do know that knowledge is power. Whistleblowers have knowledge, and knowledge in the right hands can. Can, can be as, almost as powerful as an act of God. So for those who think that they are um, impervious to being brought to justice, we shall see. We yeah. shall see. Thank you. Thank you very much. Interesting conversation. A little nugget of news piece that popped up yesterday on my radar. I think, Mike, you may know which one I'm talking about here. Uh, yeah, this is the story that came out of Dr. Simon Holland from the UK. I think even Andy may be familiar with good old Dr. Simon. Yeah. Um, Dr. Simon came out and said that uh, European VLF, which is very low frequency, uh, uh, if you want to call it observation stations around the world, have picked up a signal from an unknown source coming from potentially space, it sounds like, and encoded within the pic within the actual data itself, there's pictures, and it's something or some information getting ready to come out. Granted, Dr. Simon has thrown stuff out there in the past, may not be completely accurate, but it's an interesting proposition because, gosh, this takes us back to some science fiction movies that we've seen in the past, uh, Tim, if you know what I mean. I mean, not Tim, Keith. Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, that is really... Uh quite interesting and let's see where it leads yeah. uh, this idea of folks being uh, debunkers they call themselves skeptics that yeah. is doing a disservice to skeptics i think of myself as a skeptic someone who when confronted with information that may challenge my understanding of the world i say well let's find out more about this as opposed to a debunker saying, well, I don't want to know any more about it because it doesn't agree with my worldview. So I hear we where need you're at. To stop that's, call. that's kind of where oh, I'm so at, we need too. To stop. 
yes, we need to stop call, calling debunkers and debunkerism uh, skepticism. Debunkerism is kind of like a religion. It's a belief system. I don't want. I don't want is, to. I don't want to believe because leave right. people who want to believe in something. Leave religion right. for them. Yes. Show me the facts, uh, and then we'll all know together. And I think that's I, what we all kind of need. We need to stop the. I'm going to believe what you're saying. Oh my God, that sounds so great that I'm going to go for it, but these aliens and all these things, what are they doing? What do these numbers mean? No, it's not about that. Show us the right. facts, show us the information, and then we have evidence, we have factual representation of what's going on for us all to be able to dive into it together. Right, Keith? Yes, and I, I believe the, the term is scientism. That's the religion of debunking that, uh, you know, you're not interested in any facts that may challenge your reality. Uh, that's not how I operate. I want to know what the facts and what science leads us to as, as humanity. Uh, and so that's why I say with this information from this uh, from the EU uh, supporting the, the possibility that there may be a life trying to contact us, that's fine. Uh, that would be incredible. But given all the accounts over the years, thousands, thousands of people who have said they've had encounters, maybe some negative ones, the abductions, it would not surprise me because we don't really need proof of what people have been dealing with for many years. Yeah. Andy, you're here in the, in the back. You're from the UK. What are your thoughts? Dr. Simon is, is part of your community almost. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I've, I've just put in chat. Um, yeah, I've seen him pop up on my uh, YouTube stream. Um, I've been meaning to get around to watching some of his stuff. I haven't as yet. So I am, I am aware of him. But yeah, I, let's say I'm not exactly sure what he's been broadcasting. Yeah, gotcha. Back to Mike Disclosure. Mike, you're the one who brought this story to my attention. Would love to hear your thoughts and where you think this could go. Mike? Muted. <laughs> uh, I think he, we may have lost him to the ether uh, on that one, but that's okay. I'm that's sure okay. he'll be back. Interesting, because I'm sure he's got some great questions for you as well. Neil Carr, you have your hand up, my friend. Yeah, um, in addition to, to that, that's really uh, interesting um, there. Um, there's a lady that, that's been studying crop circles, and she was looking at footage of the, the two orbs that are seen flowing, flying in and then creating a crop circle. She was, she had, was reversing that footage. And to her amazement, she saw that the craft, the two orbs are communicating with each other through a light band. And in the band, you can see symbols of of uh, elements of the crop circle that they're about to lay down. It's just the most fascinating uh, stuff that they're, they're they're finding here, and and it's like it's like commu they're communicating. It it would seem, um, and. Uh, if if all that's valid and true, it's it's just like some of the most amazing, mind blowing uh, information going on, you know. And I, I I wish it was more talked about and broadcasted, and, and people need to hear this stuff. I think. Yeah. You, you, ahead, you know, I I was just gonna say what what really comes to mind. I don't know if anybody remembers the original Star Trek series, but in that series, there was an episode where there was some sort of uh, version of uh, like Earth. Uh, humans lived on a planet where they were uh, stuck in like the 1940s or the 1920s. And the Enterprise and the, the, the crew of the Enterprise interacting with these individuals, they did not understand the technology of, of uh, the enterprise and so they i think they thought that they were uh supernatural or gods or something of that nature we are at the beginning of the age of discovery some of us may know more than others i suspect that is absolutely the case but what 
we are finding out uh, as our technology is allowing us to understand more it really bodes that it bodes to a future that has a lot of promise we just have to continue to fight for truth fight for the information to be released and fight hard as we can to protect those whistleblowers out there that are risking all to get us the truth and to bring justice to those who um, absolutely deserve deserve it. Yeah. Great points, my friend. Glenn, one second. There was a, there's an, an another uh, news piece that just recently came out from Askapol in a conversation he had recently with uh, Representative Jared Moskowitz. Quote, there are many unknown unknowns, end quote. Next quote. We have, we have whistleblowers coming forward, but there is no concrete information. It's that same cart before the horse, meaning we're getting information passed along, but Congress is so far in the dark, they're beyond being turned into mushrooms, they don't know what's going on. So as they're hearing information come along, they don't know so, what to believe uh, at this point. Well, uh, remember that uh, reason why we can't be given the information that we desire so badly as a general public to show that there is a there there and that these folks are not just making up. We want the proof. We want the evidence. But what don't we have? Those two things, the security clearances and the need to know. Sounds like those folks are in the same position we are. And that's why. They need to have the legislation pass and, and at a minimum need to have some sort of select committee with the ability to do the work that needs to be done to uncover this information. In addition, you still have the ICIG and its investigation. I don't know the parameters of what they're doing, but I haven't heard a whole lot of press conferences to update us on where they are. So that may be news in itself. Absolutely. Glenn, you have your hand up, my friend. Yeah, thanks, Thomas. Um, no, I heard um, uh, rumors around, and I maybe, maybe have lost uh, sight of uh, the latest what's happening, but there was going to be a new um, whistleblower coming out. Does anyone know about this new whistleblower? I think it may have been said by Lou. I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, we were supposed to have a new whistleblower come out. We were supposed to have a new head of RO. We had heard before that it was going to be Carl Nell, but apparently that didn't happen. So not sure what's going on with RO, not sure what's going on with new whistleblowers. We're kind of in this doldrums right now, Glenn. Let's call it a, more than a doldrums. I'll call it a drought of information and progress going forward. It seems like there's more information going forward with Congress, but they seem to be stumbling, trying to get stuff together. It's just a complete mess, isn't it, Keith? Yes, but just remember, a context is everything, and a drought for us, the folks that are listening to this program and, and the folks that are participating in it, we are waiting for the next bit of information to come out, the best next bit of news. But if you ask your family members or ask, like if I ask my wife, you know, are you concerned about the next developments with UAP? She's going to say no. And I think that's most of the population. So we, uh, what appears to be a very long time for us may not even matter to uh, most of the population. But that being said, just because something doesn't happen right away doesn't mean that it's not going to happen. And, and I, I think about everything from uh, Lou's book, maybe David Grush's op-ed will come out, maybe it won't. Uh, the, the, uh, the Simon & Schuster bidding war for, I think it's Scott Andrews, that US Air Force uh, veteran that had a very unusual history uh, that certainly alludes to something non prosaic about his existence and whatever he was dealing with. So whatever he's dealing with is getting held back because of financial negotiations and the amount of money he's going to make out of it in the end is basically what you're saying. 
No, no, if no, there's I, a bidding was, war going sorry, on, that means saying, well, I want more money. No, you, are you, are you going to give me more money? No, are you going to give it to me? And so we're no. talking about someone talking about how much money they're going to make, and that's what's holding us back. No, no, I think the bidding war is over. And the okay. reason why I mentioned bidding war is because that was the only information I could get on the web about that, that particular uh, yeah. uh, information. But the exciting thing about that is that uh, others like Lou Elizondo have said this this guy is worth listening to. So um, that that I think is something that uh, th there are things to look forward to. Some of the things we know about uh, who was just tweeting about putting the finishing touches on his movie, on his documentary, the program. Uh, uh, James Fox. One of my, yeah, one of my favorite uh, oh, yeah. directors, James Fox. So that's going to be something. These are things that are going to hopefully help inform the public and maybe influence the the public right. narrative about but everything issue. that's but coming out is all pay for play and it's targeted towards that small percentage of people who are enthusiasts and it's not being targeted towards the mass audience that's one of the problems I've got with it. We're hoping all these things are going to move it forward, but we're targeting the UFO Twitter, UFO, uh, UFO YouTube crowd, and that's a very small slice of the pie. And like we're going to be able to say, hey, just see that nude video to our friends and family over the holiday dinner table. No, none of them are going to have to see it because what it's going after. So this is where, uh, just as we say, we don't know, we don't know. Uh, as a member of this community i can only imagine what may be in store for us from entities or individuals that really want to push this this uh discussion in a big way yeah. uh so i don't want to say hey hold on it's you know help is around the corner it's on its way because folks have been listening to that for 70 years yeah uh, i think it's i think it's uh more along the lines of just be patient and and uh understand that you may have some friends in big places that are interested in yeah. your battle. And we're all we all have great faith in Ross Colehart. He's got this new uh episode this new episodic show uh brought by News Nation out there called Reality Check. First That's episode right. great opening, second episode where did he go? MH370. <laughs> well, well, uh I think he's got to pursue uh topics as the as then he thinks they're important. I don't fault him for pursuing whatever it is that he wants to pursue, but it, like it may not be UFO related, for instance. Yeah, apparently Clearly that's the case. Yeah, well, he's he's got uh, some really strong uh, 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 experience in that field of, of journalism that speak to his credibility and speak to his uh, seriousness. Yeah, uh, about one of the I issues. think it was one of the first stories he actually covered about the importance of breaking out the truth about UFOs was actually an interview with Nick Pope. Yeah, was that about the Rendlesham incident? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, so he he's been sort of I guess involved in this since uh, you know for, for quite a bit of time. Yeah, uh, some some folks like myself have only sort of yeah. understood what's going on since 2017. Yeah. And, oh, absolutely. That, but to, to say about MH370 and the stuff that Ashton Forbes was bringing out, I just have to go ahead and say, yeah, it's actually crossed the desk of, of Joe Rogan these days. Let me bring up the desktop document for a second. Joe Rogan, uh, Jeremy Corbell told George, Joe Rogan that the MH370 videos are bullshit. So <laughs> that's kind of where that's coming from. But it's just, you know, just part of the conversation that's out there. People are covering it, but it's always sometimes it, it's a train wreck, no matter how you look at it. Indeed. Uh, let the facts go where they will. And regardless of what I think I'm going to wait for all of the information to come in before I make an assessment. And even if I think that someone has not got a lot of credibility, I'm just going to wait for the facts to come in. I'm not going to be uh, blinded by uh, bias towards or against someone. Yeah. And, and I think that's helped me in, in uh, law enforcement over the years. Yeah.
And potentially, uh, you know, one of the good things we can look at in everything is the great work that uh, Tim Gallaudet is bringing out with regards to things going on in, underneath the ocean. We know that during the first UAP hearing that was uh, chaired by Andrew Carson back in the day, uh, when uh, re representatives of the DOD were asked about what about UFOs or USOs that have been seen under the oceans, over our oceans, th they were immediately shut down by the DOD saying, no, we can't talk about that here, but we'll talk about you with it in the classified hearing. And there was supposedly some information about, what was it, about transmedium craft that Susan Goff was supposed to release over six months ago. That information is still not out there yet. So clearly there's things going on above our oceans and underneath them, for that matter. And and uh, when uh, he came out, with, when Admiral Caldeck came out with his most recent statements, that said forthrightly about the importance of pursuing this uh, effort in 10 hi I, I excitedly tweeted out i'm so proud of him i wasn't i wasn't proud of him because i'm like a proud parent i was proud of him because he is someone who did not have to uh use his credibility and and reputation to support this community in the way that he has and that is so important that more people with credibility speak about this issue in not in a stigmatized way, speak it, as it, as it from the perspective of a skeptic, someone who wants to know more and find out where the facts lead instead of summarily dismissing it. Like I've heard some people say in interviews that they don't want to follow, they don't want to pursue this topic anymore because uh, they're, they're not it doesn't they're not interested in it. that's a highly irresponsible thing to say if you're supposed to be a scientist and uh or, or researcher or any person who has any kind of level of curiosity about the world around them so i think we have to really work on uh getting rid of this uh, debunking disease uh, this bah humbug kind of attitude, which really should be ridiculed uh, for for the short sightedness which it represents. Yeah, great points. I I couldn't agree with you more. There's just so much stuff we can try and bring forward. It's about bringing the truth out, not trying to debunk it. You know, I guess the debunkers are basically just trying to throw as many things up on the wall and just try to shoot stuff down in a scatter blaster kind of uh, method versus taking a scientific approach. Or even if they are using a scientific approach like Sean Kirkpatrick is, they're leaving a lot of relevant details out to specifically prove their point rather than looking at this from an objective manner. So I, I guess we could say really that uh, skeptics have lost their objectivity for the most part, just as much as potentially believers are who want to believe absolutely everything they hear from every person. So there's kind of, it's always best to be in the middle. So, you know, there's a history of debunking. Again, let's not insult skeptics skepticism or skeptics by conflating them with debunkers this issue of debunking has i would also i i mean i would even categorize it as passive debunking and active debunking active debunkers may be individuals who are paid by the government or other entities to take a position against skeptic interests or efforts and i think of what's the guy class phil class Manzel, um, you have modern iterations of them. Those were folks in positions of authority that had connections, I believe, with um, government and took a position of discounting and disputing um, incidents and individuals that reflected uh, NHI uh, interaction. Uh, we, 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 the passive debunking is just, I think, folks who are just, you know, ridiculing it. You see them trolling, doing all these things. Yeah, you vanished. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, I was just, I was just oh, trying to oh, track okay, down okay, figure okay, out where Mike, Mike fell off the bus. Right, Go ahead, right, Keith. Right, I got gotcha. you. Yeah. Uh, so I, I was no. just saying, uh, 
you know, the, the passive debunking would just be folks who yeah, just no, I, I tried to call close you mind a times and ridicule you, you, you were just completely anything silent. I wasn't sure what happened in a way that may have some level of legitimacy. So do, it's really so not some questions for Keith, please chime in. It's okay to not believe, but we're not talking yeah, about we're, we're, we got about 14 minutes. We're talking so about I, dealing I with your help. the progression of science. And science is okay, not about in. beliefs, it's about the facts. So if you want to believe that nothing exists but human beings on this earth, that's fine. Just don't try to insist those who want to pursue science to not to 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 you know have a more objective uh, perspective uh, rather than summarily dismiss efforts to learn more. Absolutely, absolutely. Looks like we I, I found Mike. He's back. <laughs> Welcome back, right Mike. Here. How you doing? All right. Yeah, we're having. I was having some technical difficulties. I apologize. Yeah. No, I agree with what you're saying about the difference between skepticism and debunkers. Um, but what do you call somebody like, let's say, Stephen Greenstreet from the New York Post, who is, uh, you know, using the guise of a journalist? The truth of the matter is a journalist is supposed to be impartial, unbiased, and is supposed to follow the facts and report on them. There's a lot of people like him that are doing the opposite of that. So I find that the public is more influenced by if they have the illusion that these people are like Green Street being impartial and when someone like kirkpatrick puts out the recent report from arrow um it pushes that narrative along at least in the eyes of people in the general public who are not as informed let's say as we are um and that's a particular problem that i think has been ongoing for a while and it's hard for the general public to tell the difference between somebody who is legitimately giving a, a reporting of th this topic or somebody who is, like you said, could be paid by the government to specifically paint a negative narrative. Um, and, and Mike, if I, if I may, um, you know, just because he's a journalist and he's supposed to be impartial, he still has an editor in chief who's, who he needs to align his uh, views with and it's it's a job and he's got a boss and so i think what we're seeing is is you know uh reporters uh reporting what they're told to report which is this narrative you know and i wish i wish we but but we're also seeing on the other hand uh independent social media uh, just anybody putting a lot better more quality information out there and we're seeing the the two juxtaposed to each other and it makes the the narrative look really silly and plastic looking i i would surmise because i'm not a journalist but investigative journalism is something that i think we, we we really expect and think about when we're listening to the news but the reality is that most newscasters don't really have the bandwidth to invest the context or even the credit you know the the credibility of the information the validity if, of the information if i could add into that really quick totally. Keith, majority of newscasters these days are no longer reporters they're entertainers there's someone who's yeah. sitting at the desk they're reading a prompter of what comes across they're laughing with their cohorts but we're not really dealing with traditional news broadcast i mean we're not dealing with reporters anymore. We're dealing with entertainers who are telling us the news, not actually and, investigating and, and representing it. And let's add to that. Who owns most news media outlets, at least the major ones? Is it individuals? Oh, it's large, it's it large multimedia conglomerates. You've got Rupert Murdoch. You've got others out there. You've got ones that own 156 local uh, stations across the United States, et cetera. Uh, it's like that around the world also. How many real newspapers do we have left? You've, been, you've seen such an outpouring of people who used to do writing for a living are now doing something else because there's not a market for it anymore. So a lot of that so, truth and hard journalism that we're used to getting is gone. 
So that investigative journalism that we remember uh, in our histories and, and uh, uncovering uh, corruption within government and, and uh, you know, the, the uh, I'm trying to think of in the early 70s, it almost seems like it's the golden area, the Pentagon Papers and mm -hmm. Watergate and you had all these things occurring. Now, I mean, it, it's, it's uh, to be fair, it may be a number of different things that there are a lot of things going on in the world that compete for the interests of, of, of news media. Uh, but to the extent that efforts can be made to, like most recently with the Arrow Report and what happened with the Defense Department having that private uh, news uh, 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 news uh, gathering of, of the selected news uh, representatives, that really shows that the, the, the government ability to influence media is very strong. It's not like Project Mockingbird just went away. It probably morphed into different, different it's uh, versions of itself. It's alive and well today, Keith, and still yeah. ongoing. And like you said, those select journalists that were called into that meeting from Arrow before the information on the report was released publicly, that's giving us a, a list of the journalists who are on the payroll for the government, for the Department of Defense. And that's how I see it. But you earlier in the show, you mentioned reporting like from Christopher Sharp in the UK, who broke the story on the CIA's Office of Global Access, the crash retrieval program. Um, that's real investigative journalism. And I could tell you that Chris Sharp is not, he's an independent journalist and a family guy. And he's not on the payroll of a large corporation. He's independent. He does his own work. Um, that's real reporting. But it's far and few between nowadays where you can find that mainstream. You, you really can't. And the general public doesn't have direct access to the reporting of somebody like Christopher Sharp unless mainstream media outlets report on the stories that he's covering. And that's how they, they become aware of it. Uh, Ross Coltart is another example of that. He has been an independent journalist and does his own investigative reporting for a long time now. And one of the things that he would complain about is that he had to have a day job to be able to cover this topic as an independent journalist and an investigative journalist. Um, he was covering news stories on crime in Australia. That was his day job to pay his bills. And then he would recover, he would cover this topic and do his own investigative research and reporting on his own independently. But that those are the voices of truth and freedom in the media, but they're small, they have no staff, no solid payroll, and the work that they do is limited um, because of that. So it's not like it used to be like you pointed out in the days of Woodward and Bernstein when yes. they broke the Watergate story. I agree, yes. Keith. No, you're absolutely right. It's a different platform today. But, so Mike, to it's, it's not just the reporters that Keith was bringing up a second ago. It's the news organizations. That's who they're bringing in, and it's the tops of the news organizations that have potentially been bought, paid for, or inconvenient truths about things that they've done are being held over them to go ahead and have them cover the truth the way someone like the DOD wants it to be handled. Do, do you well, remember when, I was going to say, you remember uh, in uh, the 1950s, Major Kehoe's on some TV yeah. program or radio program, they turned down the yes. radio, they turned him down his microphone <laughs> yeah. rather than have him talk about the congressional hearings that were planned. Right. And then afterwards, so afterwards they explained away the reason why but 
what we are talking about is a soft version of censorship. Oh, absolutely. Oh, this you're right. Uh, censorship light. It's like uh, okay. The, Look back the, at the, the last three, four years, Keith. Are you surprised? Yes. <laughs> the censorship machine. Censor the news. Censor uh, the television. Censor the papers. Censor social media. Censor everything. And if it doesn't go along with the government narrative, you're going to get shut down because they well, don't want is, you talking about it. This is nothing new. If you look at the the, the accounts of Roswell, when the, they were typing up the report and sending it out, they got some sort of uh, disruptive, uh, I think, all typing, stop typing, which don't send out what you're doing. And then some anom ominous calls from some government uh, entity telling them, do not report on this, especially the, uh, the interview that they did of the farmer uh, the, the the news uh, entity did the interview and they were going to air it and they were threatened with losing their FCC license on the radio station. Yep. Uh, so, so there are ways to uh, softly and strongly um, influence what gets reported. And this is what we really should be focusing on. And to the degree that uh, most who are in this uh, that are interested in this subject have to do so as a second um, they have to have a primary career to pay the bills now, i don't think that's by accident especially in academia how is the funding influenced to veer away from this subject being treated seriously in academia and well, what happens if directly we'll have some people that do yeah because the government so, funding to academia. And so it's government funding means a tight leash and control over mainstream media, academia, the colleges, the universities, and any work or anything that comes out. And, and you're right, it is a form of censorship. But I think the point that Thomas was just making is that you're right. Back in the 1950s, there was a lot of censorship going on. But there's been like a paradigm shift recently yeah. from then to now there have been people the in the streets <laughs> protesting <laughs> that's no, right no, no no but no what i'm saying is i and i'm sure you've noticed this. mike you didn't that, see what i brought up no i didn't it's uh, some guy out on a on a uap uh a rally supporting senator schumer's efforts there you go oh yeah, i, I see him oh yeah very nice <laughs> that's lou elizondo yeah no, but the point that I was making, Keith, is that all across media, and not just on this topic, but there's been some sort of a paradigm shift, obviously, since the pandemic. The government has pushed a hard censorship line on all forms of media, and they had a certain message. And if you went against that, you paid a serious price, independent, everybody. And that was something that the public became aware of everybody started complaining that this is America freedom of speech. Why am I being censored? There was a huge shift since the pandemic with the government censoring any topic that they felt was not in their narrative or in their interest. And it's still going on from then to now today. That was back in 2020. Now we're in 2024 and that is still the issue so that but mike let me say this control? really quick this should Go sound ahead. familiar we can't let the public know what we know it'll cause them to panic yeah uh, you've that one before oh, wasn't we, we, this wasn't yeah. this issue brought up uh in a supreme court uh case recently where they were talking about the limits of uh, government to affect what uh, i'm just trying to remember the specifics of that but i think there was a supreme court case that there are maybe even a few that looked at the the ability of government to control what uh media media sources are able to release to the public yeah this is a, a very important issue um and to the point that some will say well what proof do you have that there's been any type of efforts to 
uh, dissuade people from pursuing uh, this interest in academia, just look at the number of programs in academia now dealing with this subject matter. Yeah, Mike, take this for um, a second with Keith. I'll be right back. I'll let the dog out. Go ahead, guys. Oh, absolutely. Go right ahead, Tom. Yeah, and I was going to say, it's multidisciplinary, this issue. Look at the Soul Foundation's efforts. They're not attacking it from a purely scientific perspective they're also looking at economic and sociological and all the different areas that it spills out into so uh there should be more efforts like the soul foundation and the efforts at rice university um uh i think there may be some other uh universities that are also starting to uh provide funding for pursuing this uh this subject well let's take a look at um the galileo project out of harvard yes right that's another good example don't you think uh, keith yes yes uh I, I think it's it's quite uh wonderful that these efforts are being made because the it shows that there is a not just a legitimate interest, but a legitimate basis for pursuit of this information, which is all that anyone who is a skeptic is arguing. Let's pursue the, the, the truth. Let's not dismiss things that we think are anomalies or things that we think are prosaic out of hand. Instead, let's look at the unusual things that occur, the small number of things that we can't explain and try to figure out what that may be. Or oh, you're right. Mean, what it may mean right. for us. That's right. Well, listen, the Galileo uh, project said that the skies are not classified. But then again, we did a report and covered on the show that there's an FBI investigation into the Galileo project that leaked out publicly. So that means that the government is still trying to censor and control that organization and the work they're doing on this topic. Don't you find that a little odd that an organization yes. like that in so, academia would be under FBI investigation? Uh, well, I, I'd be interested in finding out more about that. Uh, was there some sort of uh concern or allegation of criminal activity because the fbi investigates crime right well yeah they're supposed to but because it's an active investigation they um they did not reveal the information as far as what the investigation itself is about that's a an old go-to uh for the government to be able to not have to reveal exactly what it is that they're doing or why um but it's cool. just it's a form of censorship. I, I, my point was I'm agreeing with what you said, that this is all different forms of censorship from the government. You're absolutely right. I think you hit the nail on the head, Keith. It's a good point. Yeah, so uh, we have to uh, really devote some time and effort to look at how disinformation works how it is affecting our ability to talk about this subject, how it is uh, interfering with progress of, uh, of uh, science and scientific efforts to discover more. Because if you can influence, say, congressional leaders to not take the subject seriously, then you're never gonna get the funding you need to pursue it or you're never going to get things declassified or you're not going to have a real chance of ending stigma that's long been associated with the subject yeah. well a prime example of that keith was what happened with the schumer rounds uap disclosure act of 2023 there was a faction within the congress that ended up gutting key provisions of that bill before it was passed into law meanwhile nobody took credit or step forward and said that they were responsible for that. Uh, it's a mystery how those provisions were removed because nobody took responsibility for it. Meanwhile, uh, before that law was, before it was passed into law, the teeth was taken out of it. 
And that wasn't by accident. So you're right about influence into Congress that can affect this topic being dealt with in a full and meaningful well, way. It, what it comes down to, Mike, is there's never been any teeth in any of the NDAAs that have come out since NDAA 22 when all of this started. There's never been any teeth into it. And yes, there may have been some teeth that may have been going into NDAA for this last year. The problem is there's, you know, any teeth was there was pulled out of it. And it's going to be hard to get any of that kind of responsibility into it because it's going to come down to the government going Going and enforcing it against Congress, and they've had—I mean, Congress enforcing against the government. They've had the ability to do it, but there's no mechanism for them to go ahead and enforce this. Because look at this—the first year RO was up and going, they never got full funding like they were supposed to get, even though the legislation said the the importance of it that any funding that is required for RO is to be provided above and beyond all. Yet nothing was added into it. As we bring this and wrap this up to a close, one last person has their hand up for the night. Glenn, you've been very patient. Thank you, guys. Um, no, I totally um, agree with Mike and that, and uh, with the media. Uh, if I'm not wrong, Rick suggested that uh, there was a CIA informant in every media organization. But also, um, just to back things up with um, Keith and the Soul Foundation, I mean, look at Gary Nolan. I mean, he is a sci credible scientist, very very um intelligent and he's had his own interactions with ufos but he's actually gone down the scientific route and he's brought as far as i'm concerned very good evidence um with um other ufo crashes and the oh is that right sorry mm -hmm. We lost you there. You kind of cut off. Uh, sorry, sorry, Gary Nolan, and um, he's um, studied other UFO deposits and so forth, and he's come up with his own funding and conclusions for what happened there, and I think that's very credible. So just backing up, Keith, have you got a comment, Keith? Yes, I, I was just going to say, I mean, a couple of things are running through my mind uh, when we're talking about Congress. Remember, Congress needs our support and uh, powerful influences can try and reach out and touch them too. Remember last year when I think it was Burchett said they were going to run somebody against him in his own district? They, meaning whom? Powerful influences. People have money to spend to dump a million dollars into his district for an opponent to get rid of him, to get rid of his efforts to uncover the truth. So we have to keep in mind that, you know, th th there's risk to everyone involved in, in fighting this effort. Another thing that comes to mind is <clears throat> we have to uh, make certain to, while well, being uh, open-minded, to also be careful of those who would take advantage of that open-mindedness. And there have always, for the history of this, this uh, effort, there have been those who tried to take advantage of people in this community and there have also been those who have had legitimate mental health or behavioral health crisis that have mistakenly thought that that was associated with UAP. And finally, we need to make certain that we treat those who state that they have had encounters to treat them with the seriousness and the compassion and the dignity that they deserve as human beings. Most people don't make up the types of things that they experience to get credibility because that runs counter to conventional wisdom that all that they will receive is stigma or worse. So all of these things are really important to keep in mind, especially as more information comes out because as uh, I, I think I think somebody had said something about some really strong um, evidence of some sort of uh, NHI would be coming out. When that comes out, that will lead to other things. And those who have had talked about having experiences will be looked at in a different light. Now they will become known as liaisons. They'll be more. They'll be taken incredibly. I agree. Yes. I have a. I have a final question for you before we close out. Do you believe that because of the 
election cycle for the uh, office of the president that we're currently in the middle of in this country right now. Do you think that that's going to negatively impact this topic or take away attention from it due to the election cycle we're currently in, in your opinion? Uh, that's, that's a hard one. I would say that this would be more important than the election cycle. And uh, if some developments occur, then the election cycle may become less important to humanity. So between the two, I think this is a lot more important. Oh, I agree. Absolutely. But the thing is, I believe that as far as the general public, the people who are uninformed on this topic might be influenced more by day to day topics like what the general election will represent and their attention will be on that. Now, you're right. If something comes out like major evidence to support that we are not alone on this earth, which is what David Grush has been saying publicly for a while now then that will get their attention. But on, if that doesn't come forward, and I think the general public will be focusing on the election cycle itself, it will take away their attention on this topic. That was my point. So, so uh, we've heard this call, uh, in the UAPDA control disclosure plan versus, I guess, the opposite of that, which would be an uncontrolled disclosure. Uh, Catastrophic is there, disclosure. Yeah, catastrophic. Is Bring it on. Control, is there One a way or the other. If they plan? can't control it, they can't start the control process now, then let's have the aliens drop in and just you know, broadcast themselves all over the planet and just bring it on all at once. So, so those who would have a controlled disclosure plan would probably be very aware and interested in the political ramifications of saying those who are, you know, Maybe it's NHI, catastrophic disclosure. They may not be so concerned about the politics of Americans or humans for that matter. Oh, you're right. And that was very well yeah. said, Keith. I agree. Thank you very much for that input. Um, Interesting I conversation, think... to say the least. It's been a great opportunity to go ahead and hang out with friends this evening. I appreciate you coming out here tonight, Dr. Keith Taylor. It's been my honor and pleasure, as always. Yeah. And uh, let me go ahead and just wrap this thing up. If I could hang out in the back here for a little bit, uh, Keith, while I go ahead and do the usual things I do at the end of the broadcast, I'm sure there's some people in the back who've got some questions on that note. I want to thank everybody for coming out to this episode of Disclosure Tonight. More importantly, I want to thank people for the Super Chats tonight, including... Exactly. <laughs> Let me go ahead and bring up the list of all the people out there who have enjoyed this free broadcast tonight. Let me go ahead and see who we have out there. Let's go ahead and think. Who do we have out there in the chat? Let's take Ann Joanne. Make sure it's not too loud, blowing people's ears out. And I'll bring it down a little bit. Let's think. Ann Joanne, Brian Pemble, Charles Kerr, Charlie Foxtrot, David Dominic, EBE8, Firefly, JCAT, Kathy, Kelly Brode, King Bull, Laura Campbell, Mike Disclosure, Neil Carr, Peggy with Crockett and Tubbs, and Steve. Rough Reddy's been here along with Tamoth Man and watching vids. What a great way to go ahead and spend time with friends. More importantly, I want to thank the people in the back who have been here and have been asking some great questions tonight. Uh, that would include, thanks for coming out tonight, Andy. Yeah, thank you very much, Thomas and uh, Dr. Taylor. Uh, yeah, not a lot to say tonight, but really interesting. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, sir. Also want to thank uh, Glenn Forbes. Thanks for coming back tonight, Glenn. We missed you. Yeah, thank you, Thomas. I missed you guys too. It's been personal problems, but thank you, Keith. It's, and hi, Andy and Brian and Mike and all that. Um, I really appreciate your insight, Keith. Thank you. I'm grateful to be here. Also want to thank Neil Carr. Thanks for coming out tonight, Neil. Nick. Thank you, Thomas. <laughs> also want to thank <laughs> Nick. Thanks for coming out tonight, Nick. <laughs> You're welcome, Thomas. Also want to thank <laughs> Susan for none of your business. Thanks for coming out tonight, my dear lady. I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Dr. Present. Dr. Keith. Um, I really appreciate you uh, coming and giving us your precious time. Uh, I'm also law enforcement, ex-law enforcement, and I'd just like to say, good God, I would have loved to have worked with you. Well, uh, thank you, and I, I would have uh, enjoyed working with you as well. I think we would have made a, a good team. 
damn good team. <laughs> That's right. You better believe I it. I really appreciate also it. Also in the back for tonight, asking some questions. I want to thank Ali Alvi, and thanks for coming out tonight, Ali. Well, maybe not. I think he's in Sweden time for that matter. And that wraps us back to Mike. Mike, Mike, disclosure. Thank you for coming out tonight, Mike. Oh, I'm going to miss it for the world. Keith is a great guest, a good friend, and um, we appreciate his input and his participation in this topic and uh, here on the show with us. It was a pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for coming out tonight, Keith. It's been wonderful. What? pleasure was all mine uh i I watch you guys and retweet your uh your links when the show comes out and really uh appreciate the work that you do everybody here it's like a a family absolutely thank you very much i appreciate it as we usually say at the end of every broadcast of disclosure tonight eyes open no fear be safe everyone but go back to party city where you belong good night everybody i'll come back now here i'll see you tomorrow bye-bye